ask Brother Andrew to read this passage from 2 Peter chapter 3, where it says, But God is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 2013, at least once a month, we have been studying the character of God. And we've been studying who God is, how God is, what God is like, by looking at his characteristics that he shared with us. Because we've been made in his image. Some of his characteristics we do not share. We are not eternal. We are not all-knowing. We're not all-powerful. But other of his characteristics we do share. And that's, those are the characteristics we've been talking about this year. Today I want us to talk about patience. It says here in 2 Peter chapter 3, God is patient toward you. When I started thinking about patience and trying to think up a good example of patience, all I could really think of was impatience. I thought of how... I feel sometimes and maybe display when I'm driving or when I'm standing in line or when I'm hungry and a lot of different circumstances. I could have come up with dozens of examples of impatience, personal and otherwise. But my wife helped me think of one that's very recent for us of patience. And then I immediately thought of one of impatience to go along with it. This year, our second child, Elizabeth, played softball for the first time. She's six years old. And it's an interesting thing watching six-year-old girls play softball. Uh, but she had a coach. Uh, he lives up on Signal Mountain. His name is Ames Williams. A model of patience is that man. Those little girls would be out there, and he would have them. You know, their outfield doesn't hardly get to the bases. They're infield. They have a line about 15, 12 feet in front of the batter's box, and the infield has to stay behind that line, more than 12 feet from the batter. But you can put five or six girls out there, and they pitch to the girl in the batter's box, and she hits the ball, and three of them are drawing in the dirt. And then the other three run and fight over the ball, and when they pick up the ball, they run the wrong direction. And the girl who was in the batter's box, somebody has to show her where to run. By the end of the season, they were much better. It wasn't like that at all. But I watched him, and he never raised his voice. He never criticized. He never yelled. Patient. Tolerant of their inexperience. Tolerant of their ignorance. Tolerant of their distractedness. My oldest daughter, Lauren, played basketball this past winter. And one night they had practice and the coach was sick and he asked me to stand in for him. And when I was younger, I always thought I would coach my kids' team. But when I got older, I thought, you know, it may not be such a good idea. And so I'm out there with another dad and we've got about six girls there practicing basketball, six 10-year-olds. And we're doing drills that we've seen the regular coach do over and over again. And I'm talking to one of the girls, and they're supposed to be moving, all moving at the same time. Well, Lauren and one of the other girls are standing under the goal, and they're right in each other's faces, just picking at each other and talking and giggling. I said, listen! <laughs> Apparently that's not how you're supposed to coach 11 year olds. That's how I was coached. <laughs> They didn't respond well to it. But we value patience. We know that patience is a virtue. We know that impatience in ourselves is a bad thing. And the reason we know that is because God has stamped on our character an appreciation for patience. And that desire for patience, that instinctual understanding that patience is a good thing, is a reflection of God's own character. 
it's a reflection of God's nature, who God is, what God is like. God is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's who God is. There's several different words, or at least three different words, translated patience in the New Testament. One of which is not used in regard to God, and it's the idea of perseverance. It's the idea of bearing up under struggle. It's the idea of keeping on, keeping on when things are hard. Because God does not experience hardship. But there's another word that is often used for God, which is macrothumia. You know what macro means. You have macrocosms and microcosms. Micro is small. Is small. Macro is big. Thumia means anger. It means wrath. It comes from a base word that means to breathe hard. God is big tempered. He is long tempered. It takes a long time for God to lose his temper, to get mad, to get angry. He doesn't get set off at a moment's notice. He doesn't lose his temper suddenly. He is patient, long-suffering, macro food. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, says, For all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood. This was to demonstrate His righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. Look at the word forbearance there. The word forbearance is another one of the words in the New Testament that could be translated Patience, but it's the idea of long suffering. It's the idea of taking a long time to get upset, a long time to get mad. And what he's saying here is that from Adam and Eve through Noah, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through Saul and David, and all the way down to Jesus, God passed over the sins previously committed. There was no effectual payment for those sins. There was no effectual balancing out of those sins. There was a sacrifice of animals, of blood, bulls and goats, as an acknowledgement of the need to balance out those sins, but nothing valuable enough to pay that debt. But God forbore that. In the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins. He overlooked them until the time of Christ. For thousands of years, God patiently waits for the sacrifice that can make up for that. Because God is patient. He suffers long. He forbears shortcomings and weaknesses. You see this all through the Old Testament. Go with me to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9 gives a wonderful summary of God's forbearing, his long-suffering nature through the history of the Israelite nation. Nehemiah recounts how God brought the Israelites out of Egypt and across the Red Sea and through the wilderness. And he recounts, and this is Nehemiah and the elders of Israel making a confession to God. And they're in exile right now. They've been deported from Israel and are in Babylon and Persia. And they are now about to come back to Israel and they're making their confession. And Nehemiah and his companions go all the way back to Moses and confess sins from Moses forward. And he talks about the golden calf. He talks about the people murmuring and whining in the wilderness. Uh, Nehemiah 9, verse 16. He says, 
But they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. They refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds, which you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. God has brought ten plagues on the Egyptian, including the angel of death that put to, put to death thousands upon thousands of people, parted the Red Sea, destroyed the Pharaoh, and has destroyed Pharaoh's entire army, and has been miraculously feeding them in the wilderness. And they say, we want to go back to Egypt. Middle of verse 17. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious, and compassion. Here it is. Slow to anger. Slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. It's who God is. After they came and crossed the Jordan into the promised land, they conquered the promised land. Joshua, Caleb, the other leaders that conquered the, the promised land died and the people became unfaithful. And Judges records this yo-yo effect of the spirituality and faithfulness of Israel. They would go down the yo-yo. They would become unfaithful. God would bring in foreign oppressors. Their yo-yo would come back up. They would cry out to God for help. And time after time after time, God would help. Time after time after time, God would save. Time after time after time, God would grant their request for relief because he's patient, because he is long-suffering. And Nehemiah goes through that in Nehemiah chapter 9. But as Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, God's patience has a purpose. God is not a doorman. God is not somebody who is just pushed aside and ignored. His will, his instructions for you, though when you violate them, he is patient, giving you a chance to change. The reason he does that is to give you a chance to change. You look there in uh, 2 Peter 3, verse 9, he says, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But if you look at, that, at verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. If you look down at verse 15, Regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. Here's the, per here's the point that Peter is making. People are saying, and people are still thinking today, God hasn't destroyed the earth yet. He hasn't done it yet. I'll bet he's not going to do it. That's what they're saying to Peter. Peter is answering that argument. Peter says, you know what? They thought the same thing in the days of Noah. They thought the same thing in the days of Noah. If you go back to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, it says... God waited patiently in the days of Noah while they were building the ark. You think about that. Think if you are one of the people living in the time of Noah, but not in Noah's family. You're having a good time, doing what you want to do, living like you want to live. God hasn't done anything to you. He hasn't punished you. He hasn't brought you any calamity. Everything is good. Little do you know that he just waited. He's waiting until the ark is finished. And as soon as the ark is finished, as soon as it's loaded and it's closed up, boom, you're finished. He was patient. He waited and he waited. But he was waiting for repentance. Peter's making the same point. God is patient towards you, waiting for you to repent. He's going to keep that promise. 
of destruction. He's going to keep that promise of hellfire. He's going to keep that promise of eternal vanishment from his presence and his blessings. But he's waiting for you to avoid that punishment. The only reason it hasn't already happened is to give you a chance to get on the right side. Because he wants to save you. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says, It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Paul calls himself a persecutor, a blasphemer, a violent aggressor. He says, I am the chief sinner. I am the worst of the worst. And he's not using... Hyperbole. He's not exaggerating. He was complicit in the murder of Christians. He was taking the lead in imprisoning God's servants. He was a bad person, a blasphemer, a violent aggressor. Paul, he says, for this reason, verse 16, I found mercy. So that me as the foremost, in me as the worst sinner, in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. God's patience, the patience of Jesus, the forbearance of Jesus, the macrothumia of Jesus, Extended all the way to Paul, a murder conspirator, a violent aggressor, a blasphemer, a persecutor of the church. And it demonstrates God's willingness to forgive. But his purpose is to save. His purpose is to allow repentance. And implicit in all of that is there is no forgiveness. There is no ultimate avoidance of punishment without repentance. God is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And the only way to avoid perishing is to come to repentance, just like Paul. God's patient, giving you opportunity after opportunity, Chance after chance, hoping that you'll do it, hoping that you'll appreciate it. Romans 2 tells us to apply the same attitude that God gives to us, to other people. Romans 2 verse 3 says, But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. That's what he wants. He's patient because he wants to give you a chance to straighten up. He wants to give you a chance to to give in and recognize what you've been given. Take advantage of the blessings he's prepared for you. Go with me to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, Jesus tells a parable. He tells the parable of a man who builds a fence and a watchtower and plants a vineyard. The vineyard starts to grow, and the man leases the vineyard out to people to tend it. He then goes away to a place far away, and when the time comes, he sends a servant to collect the rent, to collect part of the produce of the vineyard as his share. They beat the servant and send him away. He sends another servant. 
They beat him and send him away. He sends a third one. They kill him. He sends several others. Some they beat, some they kill. Verse 6. He had one more to send. A beloved son. He sent him last of all to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine growers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. They took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is an intense criticism that Jesus gives the Jewish leaders of his day. The vineyard that's in the parable is Israel. The man who owned the vineyard is God. The people who leased the vineyard are the leaders of the Jews, the religious leaders, the political leaders. The servants that were sent to these people to collect what was God's are the prophets, the people that God sent with his word to straighten them out, to get them back on the right path, to tell them to do what they're supposed to do. The prophets are rejected, they're mistreated. It's exactly what Nehemiah talks in Nehemiah chapter talks about Nehemiah chapter 9. Jeremiah talks about the same thing in Jeremiah 7 and in several other places. It's mentioned how the prophets are mistreated. And then finally the heir, of course, is Jesus, and he was killed. The same thing is true for us. It's true you can make it in several different senses. Perhaps the most immediate sense is your life. God created you. He created the land on which you walk. He created the air that you breathe. He created the water that you drink. He created the food that you eat. It's His. He has given you instruction on what to do with it, how to use it. He wants His share. He's entitled to His share. He's even sent His own Son, the heir, to allow you to have what's good for you and to allow you to maintain a relationship with Him. How do you react to that Son? How do you react to those instructions? Do you treat it with respect? Do you treat it like it's important? Just like the landowner was patient. I mean, he was beyond patient, sending servant after servant after servant, and finally his own son. God is being patient with you, and he's waiting, and he's giving you opportunity, and he's trying to teach you messages, teach you lessons. <coughs> How do you react? Do you think you can do whatever you want to with it? Do you think you can take it for yourself and hold it and keep it forever? Seven the only way to be right is to give it to God. The only way to be even close to a decent human being is to give God his due. And what does he do? Your soul. He bought it back from Satan through the blood of Christ. And it's time for you to lay it in his feet. Patient and waiting. God is patient. God is patient because He wants us to repent. He wants us to reap the rewards that He's prepared for us. This patience will not last forever. And those who refuse to repent will be punished for eternity. If you have not yet taken advantage of God's patience and given Him His due, given Him the repentance, that he deserves, begin today. If you've never come to Christ and come into contact with his blood, do it today. Put your faith in Jesus. Confess your faith. Repent of your sins. 
be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, if you need to return to Christ to repent, to make right what you've done wrong, please come down front as we stand and sing.